Thanks very much, uh, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think General Neller got it right uh, that it's very difficult to be a keynote, the final keynote after lunch. It's a lot more difficult to be the real final keynote after the audience thinks they've already heard a great keynote, final keynote address. But I will do my best. Um, it is a, a great pleasure to be here uh, and have the opportunity to talk about China as a rising power. Uh, it is certainly uh, an issue that has been a central concern uh, for the Obama administration over the past eight years and undoubtedly will be at or near the top of the agenda uh, for the next administration. Before I talk about China's rising power, though, uh, let me say that I think uh, it's important to note that, yes, China is rising, but it already has risen quite a bit. Uh, and when you talk with Chinese officials and scholars these days uh, about their country, they don't often refer to China as a regional or emerging power anymore. They talk about China as a major power and at times as a global power. Uh, and indeed, uh, China's uh, economic footprint is global. It is the second largest economy in the world. Uh, it was responsible for 16% of global GDP last year and 35% of global GDP growth over the past five years. It is a nuclear power, has the largest standing army, uh, and its ability to project conventional force in its own backyard and beyond is significant and growing. And even beyond these traditional metrics of uh, economic strength and military strength, I think what matters with China is that it has a stated uh, and demonstrated desire to shape norms and institutions globally. In and of itself, I think that's not a bad thing. Uh, China's global ambition offers the United States opportunities for partnership, for cooperation, and for burden sharing. Uh, but what matters is the character of the Chinese state, uh, its intentions, and how it goes about realizing or trying to realize its objectives. So in about the next 20 minutes or so, and I will try to keep us uh, on track uh, time-wise so that you get your break, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I see uh, China beginning to shape the world around it, uh, offer a few ideas about what I think it means for the United States and for U.S. policy, and also uh, to take the theme of the uh, conference about complexity and certainty uh, seriously, I just offer a couple of thoughts uh, about uh, uncertainty in China and how that might uh, change the trajectory uh, that I'm going to uh, set out. So I see China's rise uh, in three contexts, first in its own backyard, uh, second in terms of its global footprint, and third uh, in terms of its leadership in global governance. Uh, its rise in the Asia Pacific, I think, is the most clear and immediate manifestation uh, of its ambition. Uh, I like to think of China's strategy as it has emerged over the past several years as all roads lead to Beijing. I think it is constructing a trade, investment, and security architecture that's going to, if fully realized, reshape the Asia Pacific landscape. Uh, it is doing this through institutions, some of which are old and some of which are new, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and proposed things such as the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. China is either the architect or certainly a lead player in all of these institutions. The granddaddy institution uh, is One Belt, uh, One Road, or as it now is called, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and this is a Chinese uh, initiative uh, that involves 65 countries across four continents uh, to connect China uh, to the Middle East and Africa uh, and Europe, both uh, over land and by sea. Initially, in its initial incarnation, uh, Belt and Road was really just an infrastructure plan. Uh, and we in the analyst community tend to think, tended to think of it as an opportunity for China to simply rid itself of its uh, excess industrial capacity. Uh, but as it has uh, emerged, as it has grown in the Chinese conception, uh, it has potential to be something uh, quite a bit more, uh, including uh, a sort of a free trade and investment uh, regime across all of these countries, an opportunity uh, for China to spread its soft power. Uh, as one uh, Chinese scholar, Wang Yiwei, has said, uh, it is an opportunity for China to shift the geopolitical center of the world away from the United States and back to Eurasia. Generally speaking, China receives a lot of kudos uh, for its economic and institutional initiatives uh, in the region. Uh, but as everyone in this room is certainly aware, it has also generated significant concern uh, over its behavior in the security arena. Uh, as I think it's moving from staking its claims, uh, virtual sovereignty uh, in the nine-dash line, uh, to trying to realize them. 
Uh, and everyone here, of course, is familiar with the many different uh, Chinese moves in this regard. I think, uh, you know, pushing on the East China Sea anyway to establish an air defense identification zone, the construction of artificial islands, placing oil rigs uh, in waters contested with Vietnam, uh, preemptive rejection of the ruling by the Permanent International Court of Arbitration over the Chinese dispute with the Philippines, um, and of course, numerous, I think, um, annoying and potentially destabilizing uh, dangerous actions uh, at times by the Chinese military. The uh, U.S. and the rest of the region uh, have responded in a variety of ways, uh, freedom of navigation, military exercises, new and enhanced defense partnerships, uh, diplomacy, mill-to-mill -mill engagement with China. Uh, but I would say that thus far, none of these moves has really prevailed in terms of producing a course correction uh, by the Chinese. I think that the China's rise in the Asia-Pacific raises two fundamental issues for the United States. First, how do we engage with Chinese initiatives that are additive for the region, uh, but may marginalize either on purpose or not uh, the United States? Uh, so thinking about, for example, One Belt, One Road, uh, do we seek a way into these initiatives? Uh, do we compete with them? Or do we simply ignore them and, and go about our business? And second, on the security realm, I think we have to begin to think, and I know a number of uh, people uh, here at the Naval War College uh, do this, what is the objective for the United States uh, in the security realm over the long term? Uh, and how are our relative capabilities gonna match up against those of the Chinese? Are we going to continue to aim for predominance? Are we going to try to uh, create a system, a grand bargain, a system of trade-offs or you know, mini bargains uh, over areas like Taiwan or Korea uh, with the Chinese? Or are we going to uh, eventually accept uh, you know, so what some have proposed as spheres of influence uh, and basically cede uh, the Asia Pacific to China, uh, which I'm clearly not recommending, but I do think these are the kinds of ideas that are out there and I think we are gonna to have to grapple with them seriously uh, because China's rise in the region really does raise very basic questions of the sustainability of the current US role there. China's rise has also been marked by a vast uh, expanded global footprint. Uh, over the past decade or more, uh, of course, uh, China has uh, gone far outside its borders to seek resources. It is the largest consumer of many resources, you know, 50% of all aluminum, 45% of zinc and copper, 30% of soybeans. I mean, you can pick your, your resource, uh, and China is usually uh, the largest consumer. Um, and in so doing, it has exported labor, it's exported capital, so its economic footprint really is all throughout the world. Uh, more recently, as China's economy is shifting from investment-led to consumption-based and services economy, uh, we're seeing that China is now looking more toward advanced industrialized countries in Europe and certainly in the United States, uh, seeking access to financial services, technology, buying real estate. Uh, so we should be expecting in the United States uh, an increasing engagement with China uh, in terms of Chinese investment, which uh, will raise some questions, which I'll uh, come back to in a minute. At the same time as uh, China is expanding its global economic footprint, it's also expanding its uh, global security footprint. Uh, I think it quite rightly uh, says that uh, it wants to be able to protect its own people and its own assets uh, throughout the world. Uh, it has established its first logistics base uh, in Djibouti, and it's said that part of the reason behind that is, is because of the Belt and Road Initiative, that it's going to you know, serve a, a function in, in the, you know, protecting its trade and assets there and, and connectivity. Uh, but I think if you read uh, the Chinese analysts and scholars and what they're saying, there's talk about more bases, right? There are those who say, why shouldn't China have bases throughout the world? And most recently, some scholars have talked about you know, whether China should have allies, right? Uh, so why shouldn't China have a more formal system of alliances, something akin to what the United States has? And by the way, why couldn't China have some of the same allies that the United States has? So <laughs> Xi Jinping has placed a lot of importance uh, on the People's Liberation Army, on strengthening uh, the military. Uh, and I think uh, we're going to see a far more expanded role uh, for China's military moving forward. And we're gonna need to start thinking ahead of the curve in terms of how that military and how it's the military's engagement with other uh, countries is going to begin to evolve. 
Finally, I think um, both the economic and the security footprint have been accompanied by a new push uh, on the part of uh, Xi Jinping in particular uh, to uh, push China's political power. And I think this is um, differentiated from his push to try to uh, develop Chinese soft power, because really what Xi Jinping is doing is not actually exporting soft power, because I don't think that uh, Xi Jinping has a good understanding of what soft power really is. But what he's really doing is uh, trying to control the political narrative outside of China's borders. Uh, and I think this is happening through things like the Confucius Institutes. It's happening uh, through Chinese uh, media companies purchasing uh, Chinese language media uh, in other uh, countries. It's happening through the establishment of Chinese think tanks within China and outside of China that are designed to counter the Western narrative, as Xi Jinping puts it. Uh, I think it happens through the denial of visas uh, to foreign scholars who are critical of China. Uh, so I think that there is a, a, a way that um, Xi Jinping is trying, in fact, to promulgate uh, a Chinese narrative and, and a Chinese um, sort of uh, control of the Chinese political narrative uh, outside uh, his own borders. The implications of China's expanding uh, global footprint, I think the most important, really, is, as I suggested, that we need to start thinking ahead of the curve. So, for example, in the economic realm, you know, we have a CFIUS review process. Uh, for, uh, you know, to review Chinese purchases that might in some way affect our security interests. Um, but what happens when we have Chinese companies uh, who begin not to buy technology directly, but begin to invest in labs and universities? Uh, for example, I know of a Chinese company that's going to, uh, is planning to invest in MIT or Yale and begin to invest in basic science or, you know, certain kinds of technologies that could have uh, significant defense applications. What is our control for that kind of uh, Chinese investment? I think we are ill-prepared for uh, the variety of new ways in which uh, Chinese economic actors are going to begin to engage with our uh, economy. How do we differentiate between a state-owned enterprise interest and a private enterprise interest uh, in China when the Chinese government says that it plans now or would like to take a stake of at least 1% in all major Chinese private enterprises? Uh, so I think that's something we need to think about. Uh, as I suggested, I think in the security realm, uh, China's expanded military presence you know, certainly has a lot of opportunity for the U.S. in anti-piracy, Afghanistan, security in Afghanistan, China already has significant peacekeeping forces which are very supportive of, of global norms. Um, but again, what would a system of Chinese bases, a system of Chinese allies actually mean for the United States? Uh, and finally, I think it is very difficult for us to respond to Chinese efforts to control the political narrative. You know, we pride ourselves on being an open society, uh, and we set ourselves out as a model, and we have tended to believe that by modeling good behavior, we will eventually, uh, you know, win the game. Uh, and it's not clear to me that that is the case. For example, what do we think about uh, Chinese entertainment companies uh, buying movie theaters, film distribution companies, uh, so that soon entertainment doesn't have any mention of Tibet or human rights or June 4th. So I, I just think we need to be sensitive. This is not to be enormously alarmist, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor for the kinds of new interactions that I think we're going to be having uh, with China uh, that we ought to at least be sensitive to. Finally, on the global governance front, um, she has made, Xi Jinping has made, I think, quite clear uh, that he wants China to play a, a large, you know, significant role in establishing norms and institutions. And there's a great uh, comment in uh, a speech he made in 2014 uh, where he said that he wants China not only to contribute to writing the rules of the game, but to construct the playgrounds on which the games are played. Uh, I think we've had notable cooperation with China on issues like Ebola, uh, climate change, Iran, uh, but these are hard work. These, this cooperation is hard work. You know, there are always uh, different equities uh, at stake, uh, different priorities and different values. I think there's also a difference between cooperation on pandemics uh, and cooperation on things like climate change. Uh, and I think as we're looking forward, some of the, the sort of critical issues that we're going to be looking at are cooperation on cyber, right, where our values, sort of openness and having a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, are quite different, in fact, diametrically opposed to the Chinese emphasis on a state-centered uh, stakeholder approach and protection of sovereignty. 
Uh, I also think China as a global power means uh, that there's no issue that's off limits anymore. So when I look at China in the Arctic, for example, uh, China, has been now, China is now an observer in the Arctic Council. Uh, we are a, a member of the Arctic Council. But China has begun to talk about itself as a polar power. And it has a research uh, capacity in Shanghai of 1,000 people working on uh, Arctic issues. Uh, he's talked about the Arctic as a global commons. I think gradually China's going to be pushing. It's already doing a lot of uh, joint investment and, and research, actually, with other Arctic uh, countries. Gradually, China is going to make a push, I think, to become a member of the Arctic Council. Do we care? What do we think about this? Uh, I think these are the kinds of issues, again, that we need to look a little bit around the curve and, and be prepared. Uh, so before I offer some thoughts and just some concluding thoughts about U.S. policy, uh, let me highlight two areas that I see of uncertainty uh, in China today that, that might alter or even perhaps derail uh, the type of trajectory that I am suggesting. The first would be a sustained, a sustained slowdown in the Chinese economy. I, I would give this about a 50-50 uh, chance. Uh, it's clear that economic reform uh, is not proceeding as planned uh, in China. Uh, the rising debt levels uh, continue, uh, state-owned enterprise reform has stalled. We have all the problems with state intervention that we saw uh, in the stock market and currency uh, over the past year. Uh, certainly there is uh, growing discontent among the multinationals, both European uh, and American, that are doing business in China. Uh, roughly 75% uh, have said that they feel less welcome today in China than they did uh, last year. Uh, and 25% moved uh, some of their assets out of China uh, over the past year. It is becoming a less friendly and a much more challenging environment uh, to do business. I think the slowdown in the Chinese economy um, uh, has a couple of different potential implications, certainly for social stability. I think that's part of the reason the state-owned enterprise reform has stalled, because they're afraid of laying off millions of workers. Uh, but I think it could have implications for China's ability to project influence. Uh, it could also, as many people uh, say, uh, lead to uh, growing nationalism, right, to a display of external strength to try to keep the waters uh, at home calm, uh, although I think we're already looking at a highly nationalistic uh, China today. Uh, so I think that's one thing that we want to bear in mind is this, this possibility that the Chinese economy uh, has a sustained economic slowdown. The second, and I think less uh, discussed, um, is the potential for a political backlash against Xi Jinping. And this, I might put it, about a 10 to 15 percent chance. You know, she has aggregated a tremendous institutional uh, power in China, I think as much if not more power than any Chinese leader since uh, Mao Zedong. But it's not clear how much this institutional power is matched by uh, actual support, particularly within, say, the top 20 percent of the uh, business, uh, political, uh, official, scholarly, certainly, certainly uh, elite. I think his anti-corruption campaign, as well as the political repression, uh, have alienated a sizable portion of this elite. And there's a lot of discussion uh, of conflict even within the standing committee of the Politburo over the direction that Xi Jinping is taking. Uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, clearly, there's enormous discontent uh, in both those places. Uh, I don't, I'm not predicting a coup at the 19th Party Congress in 2017. Uh, but I don't think it's impossible that there might uh, be some political pushback against this very tough line that she is taking uh, both at home and abroad. So let me conclude now with just a couple of thoughts about U.S. policy, because I do think that um, despite the fact that probably the overall tenor of my remarks has been um, to focus on the challenges that I think China uh, faces or it presents to us, I think uh, there are also some positives, some, some positives and some opportunities. Uh, first, I think uh, the U.S. Uh, can leverage uh, Xi Jinping's ambition. You know, with rights uh, comes responsibilities. I think we saw that very clearly in the case of Ebola, where China's initial offer of support uh, was about $150,000. It was less than Cuba's. Uh, but the United States and the United Nations came together and we pushed China and, and to some extent shamed them. Uh, into making a pretty significant uh, effort. Uh, I think there are efforts to build on our cooperation on climate change. You know, China has set out that it wants to be a leader in uh, clean energy and green finance. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, where we can hold them accountable. So as they develop the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, as they push forward with development uh, through the One Belt, One Road, 
uh, we can hold China accountable for the types of investment, uh, the types of uh, resource development and infrastructure development uh, that they make to ensure that it is uh, environmentally sustainable. Uh, I think we also need to be able to evaluate Chinese proposals judiciously. Uh, there is, after all, a pretty big gap uh, between the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and an air defense identification zone. And I think there can be a tendency uh, in the United States as Chinese proposals come fast and furiously. You know, with this Xi Jinping uh, administration, it's been like an avalanche of proposals uh, to not know how to react, uh, to be caught flat-footed. Uh, and to be defensive and to assume whatever's coming out of China is necessarily in some way going to be uh, bad for the United States. Uh, you know, that's not the case. I mean, we've called upon China to be a responsible stakeholder. We've asked them to step up to the plate. And when they do that, as in the case of the AIIB, uh, we ought to be able to accept it. Again, we don't have to join it, uh, but we probably shouldn't attempt to develop a coalition to oppose it. Um, third, I think, um, and I, you know, this is a little bit perhaps not something that the U.S. government does, but it happens all around the U.S. government. I, I think we need to resist the temptation, and it's a big temptation, um, to put everything into the framework of U.S.-China competition. Uh, so as someone who, you know, you just read a lot, uh, you can look at almost any uh, issue area, whether it's clean energy or it's the issue of innovation or it's, you know, academic success. Uh, and a report that's produced here or somewhere else uh, will almost inevitably place it in the, in the context of a U.S.-China competition. You know, the Pew Foundation report on clean energy, for example, each year will say China surpasses the United States or the United States surpasses China as a sort of the headline, sometimes even almost the title of the report. But what's the point of that? It's not what the report is about. And yet we begin to develop, I think, a mindset Right? That everything that is done, our infrastructure is so much worse, or their you know, educational system is so much worse, or whatever it is, that everything is placed in this comparative and competitive kind of framework. Even I think when we think about uh, what's going on in the South China Sea today, there is this tendency to place it in this US versus China. But if you look at what's taking place in the South China Sea, and you see that you know, Japan and India and Australia and Vietnam and all these different countries are doing exercises that don't necessarily involve the United States and certainly don't involve China, it's not really all about the United States and China. There's a lot of the rise of the rest that's taking place uh, in the region. And I think it would be helpful to us and helpful to the bilateral relationship if we could just take the temperature down by not putting everything in this competitive framework. Having said all that, let me say that, that I think there are also, you know, there's some, some, uh, some other actions we need to take. And we need to work with our allies to push back uh, when uh, China does things that we don't like. And this could be everything from things like, uh, you know, when they pass a non-governmental law on, on foreign uh, non-governmental organizations that will seriously undermine uh, our capacity, you know, and the capacity of Chinese civil society to work together. Uh, or you know, restrictions in business that require uh, regulations on business that require them to uh, transfer sensitive information in order to do business in China or take what's going on in the South China Sea. I think uh, oftentimes if we can form a concerted and united front with our allies and push back against the most egregious of the Chinese actions or regulations, uh, you can get some moderation in Chinese behavior. Uh, finally, I think um, you know, the U.S. must lead, and there was the earlier question about the pivot or the rebalance. Um, as I said, it's easy to get into reactive mode with China because they're just constantly putting things out there. They're always on the move, both at home uh, and abroad. It's a country that is in transition, right? So they're always passing new regulations and, and new laws. Um, it's difficult to keep up. Um, but we also have to be sure that we're not only reacting to what it is that they're putting out there, but that we are asserting our own interests and uh, perhaps making adjustments for what, what it is that they're doing, but also forcing them to adjust to us. Uh, and I do think, and I know there's a lot of criticism about the pivot and the rebalance, um, but at least from my perspective, it's an absolutely essential, maybe the most important um, element of our uh, policy toward China right now. Uh, because it really is an assertion at its heart, I believe, of U.S. interests in the region. You know, interests in freedom of navigation, in free trade through the TPP, 
right? And through good governance, through the kind of capacity building that we do in countries like uh, Myanmar. Uh, so I think uh, you know, we need to uh, continue uh, to push forward and to push our own initiatives and our own values and our own priorities. Um, okay, so one last, one last recommendation, and this just harkens back to something I mentioned uh, at the outset, and that is, again, uh, this capacity to think around the bend a little bit or to look around the bend uh, and to pay attention to what Chinese scholars or Chinese officials are writing and saying, uh, because the Chinese will often signal <laughs> uh, intention uh, a lot earlier than you start to see you know, all the pieces come together. It's a little bit like uh, like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you hear something here and you read something there and then all the pieces start to come together and soon you have an entirely new uh, picture of what's going on in China and what China is doing. Um, and we need to be able to, to take our cues from you know, those little individual pieces and not wait until we have uh, the picture already formed uh, because by then it's going to be uh, too late for us to uh, have a real chance to change it or affect it. So let me conclude there. I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions still. And I welcome any thoughts or comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Russell, uh, US Army. We talked a lot about uh, grand strategy uh, for the U.S., you know, that, that big, uh, big key theme uh, for our, our general direction on where we would like to go. So as I listen to the presentation and I'm trying to come up with what would be our, our grand strategy uh, for China, what do we say? Because if we say as part of our grand strategy that we are for uh, democracy and open economies, then it, it puts us absolute in contravention to China, which then automatically sets up this conflict. So my question is, how would we best frame how we view China in our grand strategy? All right. So um, certainly I don't think that there's you know, any harm in the, or anything that the Chinese uh, should um, get their back up about when it comes to saying you know, we're, uh, we promote freedom of navigation and free trade. I think what you're really talking about is, is the democracy element of that. Uh, and I think we can um, you know, get around that um, by saying that you know, we support the development of good governance, right? transparency, official accountability, and the rule of law. Um, I mean, we could say democracy, because China says it is socialist <laughs> democracy, uh, you know, whatever that really means. Uh, but I think we're on pretty good ground in terms of dealing with China if, if we frame it in that, in that way. Um, and you know, we have rule of law programs, which now unfortunately are getting cut back in the current political environment, but have been ongoing for you know, a decade or more uh, with the Chinese. Um, you know, the rule of law is a central tenet of their, political, their own political reform platform uh, under Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, good governance, official accountability, these are all things that I think can resonate in the Chinese uh, system as well. So I think it's not that difficult to escape it if you're willing just to translate democracy into some terms that are more acceptable to the Chinese. Today, uh, China is under the uh, uh, controlling the Panama Canal. And if they denied us the use of that canal, what effect would that have on our country economy? Um, China didn't control the Panama Canal, actually. I have trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. They have, I can't hear what he's saying. Sorry? So your question to me is, did China control the Panama Canal? Did we control it? 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 I don't think they control the Panama Canal, do they? That could be a detrimental problem for this country. I don't think they, okay, somebody. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> if, well, I mean, I think we would not be very happy about Chinese control over the Panama Canal uh, in terms of our, you know, trade with Latin America, and, and uh, uh, you know, I think it would be a, 
a problem, but I, I don't see that happening um, in the near future. Uh, Bob Hahn, U.S. Navy. So with uh, rising pluralism, an aging demographic, a, a slowing economic growth, um, are we perhaps reaching peak China in your future? Um, so, yeah, the demographic issue is a, a serious one for China. Um, you know, in some cities such as Shanghai, uh, the population uh, over 60 at this point is 30%, is or 30% of the population in some of China's, you know, major cities is, is over 60 years old. Uh, they are quite concerned um, about it. Uh, I wouldn't say we're quite at the point of peak China. I think, uh, you know, what China's trying to do in terms of their economy uh, is shift it, right? Again, away from investment-led growth and export-led growth to services-based economy. And uh, they are trying in, in a variety of ways to promote innovation, right? Uh, you know, they're pouring money into R&D. They are trying to loosen some of the educational restrictions to enable students to take time off uh, and to go do startups. You know, a lot of Chinese young people now want to do startups, you know, be the Jack, next uh, Jack Ma, you know, Alibaba. Um, I think, you know, if they can make the shift, if they can make through this very difficult uh, period of time, uh, if they can actually push through with the reforms in the state-owned enterprises, you know, open up, uh, sort of uh, make, rationalize their uh, capital allocation, uh, I think that there is potential that this is not yet, um, this is not yet peak China. Uh, they've also reformed their one-child policy. It hasn't yet uh, kicked into gear so that you can, you know, have two children. Um, but, uh, yeah, it hasn't had quite the impact that they anticipated, but over time it, it may uh, help with the demographic uh, challenge. Uh, so I'm not quite prepared to say that, that they've reached their moment in time and it's all downhill from there. I think they still have a few tricks up their sleeve, but it's going to require uh, them pushing forward with the reform program they outlined uh, back at the uh, third plenum of the 18th Party Congress in 2013, uh, and not sort of, um, you know, moving backward from that point. You've written very well on a number of subjects, including the um, the environment and the pollution and the costs and how that can even push them backward. You wrote that in the Foreign Affairs magazine, and you've written a lot of things that are centering on problems of China. The thing that I would like to ask you, Doctor, is if they had one problem or two problems, one would say, well, they'll work it through over time. But there's a confluence of these problems. The pollution gives them health care issues and health care concerns because the migration means they're not getting their claims. That, which means that they hoard money, and how do you turn consumers into a consumer economy if they are hoarding because they're afraid? So you've got the environment. And then you've got corporations which, you know, Paulson and many other people, and probably yourself would say, look, you've got to wean them off of state control. And at the same time, they have really dangerous debt levels and phenomenal overinvestment to deal with, and there are three more. And you know them better than I do. So. If you think about the confluence of those, and you were to think of any country in the West that had those problems, even to a minor degree, they couldn't do it. So I'm not sure, when you say to work through the reforms, they backed off the reforms because they're so scared that communism is gonna lose control. And that, is, that paranoia will not go away. How do you think it doesn't get far worse as you know, the fears of consumers, the fears of the debt, the bad banks, and the list that you have, do you see an actual way other than do your homework, try harder? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I guess I could say that, um, you know, if, if Xi Jinping, if the political leadership were, uh, I, think, I think the challenge now is that, you're right, Xi Jinping, his, his basic uh, directive in his own mind is to clamp down on everything, whether you clamp down on the economy or you're clamping down on the political system, right? What it requires in my mind is, you know, Xi Jinping to be willing to, to risk. So maybe it's not as much doing your homework and hunkering down as being willing to loosen the levers of control 
right? Loosen the levers of control over the economy, loosen the levers of control over the political system uh, somewhat. Uh, because I think right now what he has is a rising middle class that is demonstrating uh, every type of uh, you know, interest and value that rising middle classes have presented in every other country in the world, right? A desire for you know, good education for their children, for environmental protection, for a healthcare system that works. And he has yet to deliver on any of them. Uh, I will say that one thing that he's not given credit for, this leadership is not given credit for, is when they came into power, they did at least set out to address some of these hot button political and social issues. Right, so he came, when he came in, yes, there was the anti-corruption campaign, yes, there was the political repression, but there was also this effort on the one-child policy, on the environment, um, uh, on HUCO reform, on residency permit reform. Uh, you could say that none of them has yet achieved uh, its objective. None of the reforms has really come to fruition. We're already four years in. If this were the United States, he would not be reelected, uh, but it's not the United States. Um, and so he's probably got six more years to try to see these reforms through and to try to tinker and figure things out, uh, which is why I think the potential for some kind of political pushback and some little bit of reform, um, some, some mod moderation of his current policy might, might be what, uh, what does the trick. You know, having said all that, I do tend to agree with you. If this were a Western country, everybody would be looking at China and saying, I mean, would be looking and, and saying, you know, you are in desperate, desperate straits. You're never going to get out of this. But somehow China has this momentum of its own that you can't quite deny. Okay, thank you very much.